been an adventurer. And I've even begun to adopt it for myself because it, it probably is the closest thing I have to a job description. Um, but any discussion around that is always followed by three questions. Firstly, well, what is that? What do you do? And finally, how, how does one become an adventurer? And so I thought that should be what I should talk about tonight, how I've got into doing this with my life. And so please don't be put off by the title of the talk. I promise it's not going to be a practical how-to of eating bugs off the floor, or I'm not going to send you home to try and find shelter in a dead sheep, but whatever goes on. My story begins in 2008. I was graduating from university, and it should have been one of the happiest days of my life. But all I remember is it being characterized by pure fear, terror, this realization that suddenly I was being released from the safe, protective bubble of university out into this horrendous, horrible, wide world. And I realized on that day that I'd shamefully squandered, dwindled away my time at university. I'd had quite a good time, but I'd spent it eating pizza, going to the pub, growing a series of ill-advised goatee beards, all these things that students do. I certainly hadn't been planning for the future, and now I had to decide what to do, and so I started looking for a job. But I realized that in 2008, the world was in recession, and with a degree in film studies, I was bottom of the heap. My peers couldn't find jobs either, and everyone began to, this sense of panic set in, people began to scramble around, taking whatever they could get, just to subsist, just to keep going. And I was faced with the decision, do I join them in that, or do I try and do something different? And I wondered if perhaps I could try and see this obstacle to any career as an opportunity, an opportunity to do something else, something that I'd always wanted to do, perhaps to go on an adventure. And I'd always dreamed of setting off this rather romantic notion of just setting off into the sunset, searching for something, finding something on the road. But I, I never knew if I would have the time or money to do it. Well, now I had all the time in the world. I didn't have much money, but I had a couple of thousand pounds in savings, and that should be enough to take me quite a long way. So I decided I would set off on a journey, and I wanted to go by bicycle, because bicycles are wonderful. They're so simple. They're simple to ride, simple to maintain. You can just throw a few belongings in some bags, strap them to the side, and off you go. You can pedal as far as you want. You can pedal all the way around the world if you want to. And I decided I would begin my journey in New York City. The reason being that if I started from my front door here in Northern Ireland, and I set off on my heroic expedition, and the hills were too big and it was wet and cold and windy, it would be very easy just to turn around and come crying home to my mum. And if I started in New York, that's already thousands of miles away from home. There's no option for failure, I thought, I hoped. And <clears throat> I set off on this journey, and quite quickly, within seconds of beginning, I realized that there was a major flaw in the plan, which was that I was utterly clueless. I didn't know what I was doing. And th th sh I should have had a hint, because... When I was 15, I tried to cycle around the UK with a couple of friends, and I, th I think it took us about three and a half days to get out of Belfast. I, this was not a natural fit for me. But I set off nonetheless. My bike was so heavy. It was overloaded with all this stuff. And to begin with, I couldn't even pedal it. I couldn't get it to move one inch. So I just took some stuff off and threw it into the street, got rid of it. Someone had a bounty of free clothes. And I, 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 I made it out of New York but it was still hard going. It was winter in the east coast of America. There were snowstorms. I was cold. I was tired. I was lonely every night. I was alone in my little tent, terrified the bears were going to come and get me. And I spent most evenings just crying myself to sleep, reminding myself, brave explorers, don't cry, between sobs. And it just, for the first couple of weeks, it just got worse and worse and worse. And after a while, I just, after two weeks, I remember distinctly stopping my bike and getting off and just sitting by the roadside with my head in my hands, thinking... I'm not sure I can do this anymore. And I sat there for quite a long time. And eventually I thought, well, what do I know? What are the facts? I knew that, firstly, sitting there wasn't doing me any good. Indecision, inaction, that wasn't going to take me anywhere. I would sit there forever. I wasn't going to get anywhere. I also knew that giving up just because this was hard, that was not going to be a very good idea in the long run. It might seem great straight away, but ultimately I would regret it. I, I had to remember I was extremely privileged to be able to go on such a reasonably self-indulgent jaunt around the world on a bicycle. And just to give up because it was hard, well, I would regret that. I, what, I didn't know what would lie ahead if I kept going, but the hope was that I would begin to develop some skills, adapt to this life. Humans are wonderfully adaptable, we know that. So I would hope to adapt and then eventually maybe even enjoy the experience. And I convinced myself 
to keep going. And that single decision is the best, probably the, the only really brave decision I've ever made in my life was to keep going. And it worked out well. I did adapt. I did begin to enjoy it. I still didn't know where I was going, but I made it all the way across America until I hit the West Coast. And then I came down to Mexico. And the next year of my life was characterized by a series of events. And then my reaction to them, I tried to cultivate a mindset, an, an adventurous mindset, whereby every time I was faced with a, a fork in the road, metaphorically speaking, I, with, with the easy option on one side and the harder but ultimately more rewarding option the other way, I would always choose the latter. And it, was, it, wasn't, a difficult, it wasn't an easy thing to do, but it paid dividends. It, it led to some wonderful encounters. In Mexico, I met a pilot who offered me a free plane ticket to New Zealand. So I went to New Zealand and rode my bike around there for a while, and then went to Australia, and finally worked my way up into Southeast Asia, up through Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, China, all these countries and cultures I knew nothing about until I was there having an adventure on my bicycle. And eventually, 14 months after setting off from New York, 14,000 miles of pedaling later, I arrived into Hong Kong. And my money had run out. This was the end of my journey. But I was delighted. I felt like I had, had it such a great experience. I felt like I'd learned so much more during this time than I ever did at university, for example. And I was ready to go home. And while I waited for my flight, wondering how I might reintegrate into society after this, I stayed with a guy I'd been put in touch with, a lovely guy called Rob Lilwall. And he was similarly inclined to me in terms of his love of the outdoors and the wilds. But the difference was he was a professional. He made a living from this. And I showed him my pictures and videos. And eventually he said to me, I'm thinking of going on a new adventure myself. I'd really like to see more of China. But this time I'd like to not cycle, but walk. I want to walk from the very north of the country all the way down and see how China changes, how the people, the landscape, the culture changes at the slowest speed possible. And I want to be self-sufficient, carry everything in a rucksack, and take a video camera so I can record the journey and then share it with people all over the world, people who will never get a chance to go to the interior of China. And then he said something very strange to me. He said, would you like to come with me? And my first thought, of course, was, well, no, you madman. <laughs> Cycling was hard enough. Walking just sounds atrocious. But the more I thought about it, I realized that within this offer was a huge opportunity for me to continue doing things I loved, to continue pushing myself and challenging myself, which was, to a large degree, what the bike trip had been about. But it was also now a chance to begin to maybe forge a career out of something I was passionate about. Making this TV show using, ironically, the skills I learned at university would possibly be the start of a career. And the only thing really holding me back was fear, pure terror, in fact, of what it might take to walk that distance. But fear, terror, these aren't worthy barriers to us doing things that we desire or we really want to do. And I also thought, well, what waits for me back home? I really don't know. The world is still in recession. My film studies degree still isn't going to take me very far. I'll probably just have to get a, any job I can to keep going, any minimum wage job. And walking across China seemed a much better option. So I said to Rob that we would try it, and we began to make plans. We figured out it was 3,000 miles from the northern edge of the Gobi Desert all the way down to Hong Kong. Now, that, that's a long distance, whatever way you're traveling. If we set off east from here and walked for 3,000 miles, we'd reach Kazakhstan. It's just a phenomenal distance. And th we figured out we would have to walk about 25 to 30 miles a day, a marathon a day, six days a week for six months, carrying a backpack of about 25 or 30 kilograms. And even just thinking about it scared me. I, I, to be honest, I didn't know if we could do it. And if I'm really totally honest, I was pretty convinced that we couldn't do it. But I didn't know. And that's key, because we don't know what our limits are until we push at them. We don't know what we're capable of until we try. So Rob and I, we could but try. So we, we flew from Hong Kong directly north to Mongolia. This very odd experience of a four-hour flight north, followed by a six-month walk all the way back down. And when we, when we arrived in Mongolia, we, we were in this dusty ex-Soviet frontier town. We gathered up our equipment, and that was it. That's what it came down to, just two guys setting out into the Gobi Desert, the largest cold desert in the world outside of Antarctica. And in another wonderful moment of expedition planning intelligence, we set off in winter. So it was already minus 20. Um, and for the first 10 to 12 days to the border with China, we would see nothing, no roads, probably no people, certainly no shops. We had to carry all of our supplies, our food and water, in this little trailer behind us. And the whole experience was 
again, terrifying. But what a place, what a place this desert is. This is a land without borders, a land without boundaries. This is a place where you can turn around 360 degrees and see absolutely nothing made by the hand of man. How, how wonderful an experience that is. Scary, yes, but wonderful, liberating as well. And quickly we got into the rhythms, the routines of the expedition, walking all day, then trying to get as much rest as we could in our tent at night, and fuel, rest, refuel. This food is always on my mind when I'm doing an expedition, and this trip for six months, my diet was instant noodles and various forms of horse meat. It was pretty horrible, but you're so ravenous, you just gobble, oh, I wish there was more horse meat. And then <laughs> we, we'd keep going through this desert, and it seemed to get colder and colder and colder as the days passed. And I remember one morning looking up, very confused, looking at the sky. It was getting darker and darker and darker. And it wasn't nighttime, it was just getting darker and darker and darker. And saying to Rob, this, if, this looks like a snowy sky. If I didn't know any better, I would say it's going to snow, but it doesn't snow in the desert. And then so for three days it snowed in the desert. <laughs> and it just got colder and colder and whiteouts and blizzards. And we wandered along thinking, what on earth are we doing? This is utterly miserable, walking through this horrible place, pulling this stupid cart. Uh, suddenly that job in Tesco's is looking very appealing back home. Why am I here? What's the reward of this? What is the point in this? And every so often there would be a glimpse of the point. Sometimes it was simply the satisfaction of having walked another 20 miles south, knowing that we'd pushed ourselves beyond anything we'd ever done before. Sometimes, sometimes it was coming across a, a Mongolian gare, the homestead of the nomads in the desert, and entire families live in these single-room structures. They would see us walking through the blizzards and invite us in, share their food with us, give us part of their floor to sleep on. And these were the things that invigorated us, buoyed us, and kept us going until finally, finally, after 12 days, we crossed the Gobi and arrived into the border town with China. And we were ecstatic. This was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. The, the crossing of the Gobi, it, it was... It was like summer in Northern Ireland, just atrocious, but with enough points of hope that carry you through to the other end. <laughs> and I felt battered and bruised and exhausted, but it was also very soul-destroying to look at a map and see we'd covered 5% of our overall goal. But crucially, what we'd learned was that if now, now the physicality of the trip didn't scare us. Walking 3,000 miles sounds like a long way. It is a long way, but... It's very simple, really. It's just a repetition of actions. Wake, walk, eat, sleep, and repeat. And for that reason, anyone in this room could walk 3,000 miles. Not that you'd want to, uh, but you, you could. And I don't say that lightly. It's a very simple thing. The mental side is much tougher, but now we had confidence that we could do it. And just as I had a turning point on the side of the road in my bicycle trip, so here was the crux of this. And now we had, crucially, this belief in the fact that we could do it. And we made our way south through China with this. And we found we had a wonderful journey, not without hardships, but wonderful. We, we found a country where old is meeting new head on. And in reality, the old is getting bashed on the head by the new. This is a place we, we hear all the time about the, the rapid economic growth, the industrialization. Well, you can see it. You can see cities expanding outwards at a phenomenal rate. You can see brand new cities being built in the midst of the desert. You, you find highways, freeways, the arteries of a nation popping up all over the country. This is a place where you can see hundreds of millions of people moving from the rural areas to the urban centers. This is a place unlike anywhere else. It's a unique and wonderful place, a country moving at a rate of knots. It's a wonderful place to visit if you ever get a chance. That's the new side, which is fascinating. But what drew me there and what gave me the memories in the end that I'll cherish the most is more... The, the older side, the historical side, the Great Wall, walking along the Great Wall, sleeping every night in its shadow, walking over barren hillsides in the north of the country, coming up over an empty mountain, and then coming down the other side to find, to my surprise, entire villages cut into the side of the cliff with wonderful, curious locals wondering what on earth we were doing there, and then having them send us on to our next destination, the, the mighty Yellow River of China, our natural highway south. And slowly, slowly, we moved through this great country. We, we moved along and saw how winter turned to spring. The, the rice farmers came out, the rice harvest began, and slowly spring turned to summer. And we reached Guilin, the, the beautiful limestone mountains of Guilin, from the subarctic, from minus 30 to the subtropics and plus 30. We saw, we saw things we never wanted to see, the inside of a Chinese police station after we wandered into a closed zone. And finally, we saw the lights of Hong Kong, 
And Nathan Road, we, we wandered down the main drag and into the iconic waterfront, the harbour, and crossed over. And Rob's poor wife, who'd waited so patiently for him, was there. And the next day, we walked just to, to the ocean, where land literally runs out into the sea, the perfect place to finish a walking journey where you can't walk anymore. And I, I love this journey. I, I love all the trips I do. I, I'm interested in the storytelling and sharing the experience. I make films, and I make TV shows, and I write about them to share that. And I, I suppose my aims are to explore and to entertain and to educate and to encourage people to think and challenge their own preconceptions of limits and capabilities. I, if someone as clueless as me can walk 3,000 miles, just think what you can do. It's a very, very simple concept. And so let's come back to that final question. What's, wh how do you become an adventurer? Well, you, you have adventures. That's, that's the simple answer. You could have told me that before we started. But I think that can be split down into four quite distinct categories, uh, distinct elements. And I hopefully you'll agree, my theory is that these are actually transferable to any field, whatever it is that we're interested in doing. And the first, here, here was my big revelation from doing these big trips. Adventure is not about big expeditions. It's not at all. Adventure, in its very simplest form, is a mindset. It's, it's having that choice every single day of the easy path or the harder yet more complicated one, but ultimately that offers more reward and choosing the latter one every time. And so we set that, we choose that adventurous mindset, and then we act upon it. Whether it's one more pedal stroke, one more footstep, it's, it's that constant forward motion. We've heard already tonight that there is a place for inaction in the world, but it's not here. Inaction, indecision have no place in this, in, in this form of moving forward. So we, we set the mindset, we take action, and then we give ourselves the best chance of success. And then we get ready for things to fall apart, because that's what happens. Things just change. In walking through China, things happen that I couldn't predict, and I had to be ready to adapt. Cycling in Cambodia, the same thing. In everyday life, things happen all the time that we cannot predict, and we have to react. And so I think that's the third key thing, a willingness to react and to change. And it's a wonderful thing. It's the wonderful thing about life, how unpredictable it is. But we need to have that willingness to be able to change and adapt. And finally, the glue that holds all of this together is a, a wonderful stubbornness, a refusal to accept anything less, a refusal to give in. And so that's my theory. Those are my four points of adventure philosophy. Set the mindset, act, be willing to react, and refuse to give up. And my hope is that the path that that leads me on or anyone else on is ultimately a very, very rewarding one. Thank you.